I'd like to welcome you to our evening service scheduled for uh, the 15th of November. Uh, tonight we're going to be uh, looking at the matter of Bible translations. At uh, Open Door we use both the King James and the New King James translations of the Bible. And so this will be a two-part series uh, this evening introducing the topic and looking at the history of the King James Version and then uh, Lord willing next Sunday evening service for the first Sunday evening in December uh, talking about the New King James Version and uh, looking at the continuity between those two translations so I hope it'll be a help to you this is a topic that I addressed uh, well over seven years ago and with the uh, process of time and with new people coming into our church felt it would be a good time to uh, to uh, revisit that and of course not sure when we'll be able to have evening services uh, again and so uh, there'll be a scripture reading later on uh, from the uh, pastoral epistles and I trust tonight that we would rejoice in the blessing of translation that uh, God has raised up faithful men and women over the years to do the uh, wonderful work of Bible translation to give people in their own languages right across the world the word of God that they can read and they can know Christ the saviour of the word and so uh, with that in mind let's come before our God in prayer Father we thank you for our service tonight thank you for those that have uh, worked hard to pr uh, put together this service uh, both this morning and tonight thank you that Jesus said that we can be sanctified by God's word which is God's truth we thank you for the blessing of translation that from the Greek and Hebrew can come Bibles in many different languages across many different generations and can be a wonderful untold blessing to God's people and Bibles can be put in the hands of unbelievers and they can read the word of God and come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Father, help us tonight to have a better understanding of the work of translation, in particular the Bibles that we have. And we give you thanks and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible reading for our sermon tonight is from 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 14 to verse 17. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for a proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. I'd like to bring a, a message to you uh, that uh, probably won't finish until the next Sunday evening service, so we'll have a, a two-part series to this. Uh, but uh, a, number of, a number of years ago, I did some teaching at Open Door on, uh, on the use of the new King James translation. It's a translation that I've used for preaching for many, many years. And uh, it was one that uh, I wanted to be able to keep using uh, when coming to Open Door as a pastor. And so what I'd like to do uh, in this message and also in the next one is to uh, talk about uh, why I use and consequently why our, our church uh, normally uses the New King James translation and it is of uh, some importance to us because uh, being a, a Baptist church that is independent uh, we have uh, wonderful ties and fellowship with many many other churches uh, I guess most of whom would would use the King James translation and it's a translation that I've been brought up with and uh, certainly love and uh, continue to use myself from time to time and uh, when i preach in other places uh, 
virtually always use the uh, King James translation. And so as we uh, talk about this tonight, uh, we're not really just talking about any one particular translation, but we're also talking about uh, translation generally. Translation generally. Because uh, unless you are reading the New Testament from the Greek or the Old Testament from the Hebrew, and of course there's a bit of Aramaic in some of the chapters as well, but unless you are going to the original languages, uh, you and I are using a translation. And sometimes we, we, we tend to think just of, uh, of our own experiences as believers in a Western country speaking English. And um, of course, we have brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world that are using translated Bibles themselves in various European languages, in various Asian languages or African languages or dialects. And so the point is that uh, almost all believers, almost all believers are using translations of various kinds and uh, quality. And uh, let me just make a point at the beginning tonight uh, translation, translation is as much an art as it is a science. It's as much an art as it is a science. Because when you have different languages and you're, you are, say, translating from one language to another one, because all languages are, are different, obviously, obviously, uh, there is always going to be a challenge in, in translating one language to another because there isn't always an exact equivalent word or, or phrase from one language to another. Now, let me give you an example of that. Um, for, let's take, for instance, John chapter 3, verse 16, one that we all know and love. And I'll, I'll read it in the King James tonight. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it's fairly similar in the New King James Version. Now, that's a translation. It's a translation. Let me give to you what we call a transliteration a transliteration. So you could say it's even more literal than a translation. And a transliteration is, is, is really just trying to take a bare English word for a Greek word with, with, without any kind of polish, without, without even thinking about any kind of readability. So John 3.16 transliterated it reads this way, Thus indeed God, the world, that the Son, the only begotten, he gave, that everyone who believes on him might not perish, but might have life eternal. Now that's a transliteration. And you can see why we go for translation over transliteration. Because while transliteration is certainly more literal, it is much less readable and understandable. Uh, let me give you another transliteration. Say from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans 12, 1. Now, I'll read it in the New King James. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Again, it's readable and it's faithful, accurate. A transliteration, however, reads this way. I exhort, therefore, you brothers, by the compassions of God, to present the bodies of you a sacrifice living wholly to God, well-pleasing, which is the divinely reasonable service of you. So you see the, the issue here. You can give as much as you can, you know, one English word for a Greek word, or sometimes two English words for one Greek word. It is certainly more literal, but less 
readable. Now let me just do one more for the sake of completion. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Well loved, I read in the King James. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I remember learning that, memorizing that as a child. Let me give you the transliterated version. For by grace you are saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is God's gift, not of works, that not anyone might boast. So the work of translation is not just transliterating. It's not just carrying one bare Greek word for an English word or more, or vice versa. It is giving a sense and making something readable. Translation is as much as an art as it is a science, an academic discipline. And so... Coming back to the topic tonight in the use of the New King James translation, I want to talk about where the King James version came from, and then I want to talk about where the New King James version came from, and uh, why I contemplated uh, moving from one version to uh, another. As I said, I taught on this seven or so years ago, and since that time, we've had many new people come into the church that sometimes have had questions or asked me about this. And so I felt that uh, we could do this having a you know, few messages up our sleeve uh, until the conclusion of this year. So what about the King James Version? And it's of relevance to us because in many independent Baptist churches, in Bible churches and other such churches, uh, there's been a tradition of using, a practice of using the King James Version. Well, what, what is the King James Version? Where did it come from? Well, the version itself was commissioned by the English monarch James I in 1604. Hence, King James Version. The version itself is named after the king who commissioned. He didn't translate it, but he certainly commissioned this new work. A highly skilled group of translators were appointed, many of whom Anglican Puritan uh, spent seven years producing a revised translation. And I think we need to pause there for a moment. Uh, this was not an entirely new product. This was a revision of some existing earlier English translations. The translators of the King James Version followed the traditional Hebrew and Greek texts. What I mean by that is that they had at their disposal uh, two Hebrew texts and some six Greek texts of the New Testament. The translators of the King James also had regard to uh, what we call the Septuagint, which was... And, and, and stay with me, stay with me, it was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So, so the Jews had a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. The, the translators also accessed the Latin translation of the Bible that had, that had dominated the church scene for hundreds and hundreds of years, known as the Latin Vulgate. Vulgate in the sense of, of a common language of the people. The King James translators also looked at contemporary translations in the Spanish, French, Italian, and German languages. They were all consulted. Why? Because when you are giving a revision of the Bible, you are duty-bound to look at everything that has been produced up to that point. Now, I mentioned to you that, that there had been earlier English translations of the Bible. Let me give you some. There was, there was the work of William Tyndale in 1530, and then some, some later uh, productions in 1535 to 36. 
there was the Coverdale Bible in 1534. There was the Matthews Bible in 1537. There was the Taverners Bible in 1539. The Great Bible of 1539 as well. The Geneva Bible 1560. The Bishop's Bible in 1568. And the Douay or the Roman Catholic Bible of 1609 to 1610. There are a whole number of previous English translations. And I have the notes here if you'd like a copy of those again the king james version was complete in 1611 and so uh, yeah sometimes you will see um kjv 1611 on some church websites or on on social media those sort of things because that's when the first king james version came out i have a copy in my office and it, it, it is hard to read because, again, of the old, older English words and expressions. So the first edition completed in 1611. And there were a further five revisions. Five revisions. There were two Cambridge revisions in 1629 and then 1638. And there, then there was the planned edition of 1653 to 57, the Cambridge edition again of 1762, and finally the Oxford update of 1769. It is the final revision of 1769 that if you have a King James Version at home, you are most likely holding. And I, and I go to this length, I go to this length, just just to show you that the translators themselves uh, went to all that was available for them to to continue the ongoing work of bible translation because as language develops and changes you have a need for ongoing translation well what was what was the the philosophy, the mindset of the King James translators. What were they, what were they seeking to do when they came to those, those Greek and Hebrew texts? When it came to translating the Word of God, they had what they called a formal equivalence technique, a formal equivalence technique. And this was an emphasis on the form of the original language. You obviously want to be faithful to the original language with, with, with the assumption that the form can largely be carried across into the new language. You can capture and you can preserve the original wording and the intent of the Greek and of the Hebrew. And what is ironic, what is ironic is that when the the uh, translators to what would become the King James began their work, and as they continued their work, do you know what they faced? They faced opposition. And the opposition went this way. Why do we need another translation? Why do we need another one? We have... Tyndale and Coverdale and the Matthews and the Taverners and the Great Bible and the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible. Why another one? Why another one? As there is the same opposition today. And I, today, I want to I want to tell you, and you know this to be true. You know this to be true because at our church, we use the King James and the New King James. We use both. We use both. We know that the King James Version possesses a wonderful literary and poetical quality. We know there is something special about the King James Version. There's something special about its translation. But understand this, as special as it is and as good as it is, it was itself a revision of previous translations and relied heavily upon particularly Tyndale's work. Now, I'm thankful that what the King James translators left for us, as well as leaving, obviously, 
their work of translation is they produced a fairly lengthy preface to the King James Version. Uh, this was kind of like an introduction to their work uh, to explain themselves to the reading public. And this is this is worth reading, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, I know that it's in a sort of a, a very refined earlier English, but it's worth us considering. This is what they said in their preface to the 1611 edition. They said, we didn't think it too much to consult the translators or commentators, the Chalde, Hebrew, Syrian, Greek, Latin, uh, no, nor the Spanish, French, Italian, or Dutch. Neither did we disdain to revise that which we had done, but having and using as great helps as were needful. We affirm and avow, they said, this is what we believe, that the very meanest translation of the Bible in English, you know, the, the, the one that is least polished, the simplest kind, set forth by men of our profession, they were translators. For we have seen none of theirs of the whole Bible as yet containeth the word of God, nay, is the word of God. So even a very plain translation carried with it when translated correctly, obviously, the authority of God's word, scripture. And they make this comparison. They said, they said, as the king's speech, like the king's speech, which he uttered in parliament, being translated into French, Dutch, Italian, Latin, is still the king's speech. Though it be not interpreted by every translator with the like grace, nor so fitly for phrase, nor so expressly for sense everywhere, Okay, so you can take the king speaking speaking, and then translate in so many different languages and some translators might do it a bit better than others. Still the king's speech. Still the king's words. And then they say, truly good Christian reader, we never thought from the beginning that we should make a new translation, nor yet to make of a bad one a good one, but to make a good one better or out of many good ones one principal one not justly to be expected against that hath been our endeavor that our mark or that our goal and again a little bit wordy but the translator is very clear we're going to go to every available resource and we're seeking to make an ex uh, some earlier translations better ones the King James translators, in their preface, never said, this is the last English Bible we should ever read. Or, our work of translation is done forever. There won't be another need to translate a further English Bible again. Never said that, never claimed that. And that's very important. Because to, to, uh, to talk about the new King James, we need to talk about the King James as as we have been already today, and I've gone to that uh, I've gone to that trouble this uh, this evening uh, by way of introduction to give us a sense of the history of the King James version, so that we can understand the New King James version. Uh, this has been a topic that has been of some, of some controversy, of some controversy uh, within churches, and it's really been a controversy for for a few reasons. For a few reasons, this can be a very emotive, emotional subject because when we have our Bible in front of us, whether it's the King James or something else. Hey, that is that is our Bible. This is this is God's word for me. Uh, you know, we don't want to hear people speaking badly of it or or attacking it or suggesting that you should you might want to use something else, etc., etc. 
and then superimposed upon upon that has been some very strange teaching, some very strange teaching of the last generation or two, where uh, some have gone so far as to say, so far as to say that that the King James Version is is not only not only say the best English translation, which it may well be, may well be, you can argue that point. But people go beyond even that. Not just it is the best translation, but that it, it is the only English translation that, that qualifies as the Bible. And that every, any other kind of English translation is, is inferior, even, even in error, or at worst, a uh, product of you know, satanic influence, and, 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 and on and on it goes. And so some have uh, have made the stakes in this debate very very high. Like it's it's like it's about light and darkness really. And and this has this has produced untold division and trouble across many many churches. And it is a shame. It is a great disgrace. And so yes, the King James Version is a wonderful translation, and it is a good translation, and it will always be that. And uh, if you if that's your translation that you use and read, then keep doing it. Keep doing it. I, I would not dissuade you from anything else, but I would simply suggest, and as I have taught previously and, and, and will do so today, that there are other other options available that, that are beneficial and helpful to God's people uh, for the simple reason that language is on the march the English language, other languages change and and that translations do need to keep up with that because it is the will of the Lord that people have his word in their mother tongue. Uh, William Tyndale, can I remind you, was driven by the desire that, that the English plowboy, the English plowboy, could have a Bible that he could read and understand. And so in our day and age, when you have when you we have many people, particularly in our even in our own church and, and in our country, that they, they are bilingual. Might even have more than two languages where English is their second or third language. I believe we have a divine we have an obligation. We we have a we have a, a divine commission to, to, to make sure that, that they are not frustrated in their reading of God's word and can have translations available to them that are accurate and that are readable because it is translation, not transliteration, that is the issue. In my, in my previous work, my previous work occasionally, when I would meet with people and there was a language barrier, uh, we would hire an interpreter for for the conference or for the day and so I'd, I'd be in the room with 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 the client and we'd have an interpreter there and then i would i, I would speak to them and interpreter would speak in their language and then you know they would speak back and the interpreter would relate to me and and there'd be occasions during these conferences during these conversations where the interpreter would would stop and think because I had used an English word, or they had used a word in Mandarin or, or Arabic or in Greek Greek that didn't have an exact English word, so the interpreter had to stop and think and improvise or find the closest word available. That's the challenge of Bible translation. And it, it, it will always be with us. And so that's just an introduction tonight for us to move into what the new King James translation is, we need to understand about the King James translation. I hope that this has been a, a useful introduction for that purpose. God bless you. Our benediction for our service this evening is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, where Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation or origin for prophecy never came by the will of man, 
But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen.